glad to have all of you here this morning with us in person. And also, I'm so grateful to those of you who watch online. We're happy to have you as well. My name is Shirley Haugen, and we have been studying in the book of Genesis. Um, and today, we're continuing with our stories about Jacob. And, you know, in today's Bible story, uh, we're going to talk about Jacob, who literally wrestles with God. And, uh, and you know, we, before he was even born... Jacob was wrestling with his twin brother inside the womb. <laughs> Y'all remember that from Genesis 25, 22, it said, the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. So, so this whole wrestling stuff started with Jacob even before he was born. He was going to wrestle with people, and he was going to wrestle with God. Um, so let's just do a quick review of Jacob's life to kind of refresh our memories. But, of course, we talked about how he wrestled in the womb with his twin brother. And we know that when Jacob was born, he came out clasping the foot or the ankle of his twin brother Esau. So uh, I just love that image, you know, one baby is born and the other one is like hanging on. <laughs> so um, uh, that's kind of how he came out. And Jacob, it, when he was older, he got his brother Esau to sell him his birthright for just a bowl of soup. So um, Jacob was kind of a sly one. And, um, and then, of course, we know that he got his father Isaac to give him the blessing by doing some trickery because we know Isaac wanted to give the blessing to his favorite son Esau but instead Jacob and his mother kind of tricked Isaac into giving him the blessing um a Esau of course got so angry with his brother that he was threatening to kill him as soon as his father passed away so Jacob had to leave Canaan he had to leave the promised land he he left to run from his brother who wanted to kill him, but he also left to find a bride. And so he went to his uncle Laban's home and it was along his journey to see his uncle Laban that he had that dream about the stairway to heaven. And that was when Jacob heard for the first time for himself, God speaking to him, telling him promises, the same promises that he gave to his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. Now God gives them directly to Jacob too. And it was a really big spiritual moment in Jacob's life as he was journeying to his uncle Laban's. And uh, of course, we know when he got to his uncle Laban's house, he fell in love with Rachel. Um, and he agreed to work for seven years for Rachel's hand in marriage. But then his uncle Laban was greedy and deceptive himself, and so he tricked Jacob into marrying Leah. <laughs> and when, when Jacob realized what happened, um, he was very upset, of course, but he agreed to work for seven more years for Laban so that he could earn, again, <laughs> uh, Rachel's hand in marriage. So he worked for 14 years, seven plus seven for Rachel, and then Laban convinced him to stay there another six years, and they had some kind of an agreement over the sheep, where he was going to multiply the flocks while he was there another six years and try to make some, some wealth for himself. Um, and in spite of Laban's greed and deception, God did bless Jacob during those 20 years that he was there in Laban's household. He blessed him with four wives. He had not only his beloved Rachel, but he had Leah, and he had the two maidservants, Bilhah and Zilpah. And during that time there, he had 12 children. He had 11 sons, and he had one daughter, Dinah. Um, his 12th son, Benjamin, hasn't come yet. <laughs> we haven't got to that story yet. Uh, he'll be born later. But during that 20 years, so God blessed him with wives, with all these children, and God also blessed him with lots of wealth. So Jacob was able to multiply his flocks, and he had many animals and lots of male and female servants and so God definitely prospered him and it was the end of our last lesson where Jacob decided it was time for him to leave he knew that Laban was taking advantage of him in fact he was afraid of Laban he was afraid Laban was going to make him leave his wives and his children there so he knew he needed to go back to the promised land 
And so he did. He left with all his wives and his children and his animals and his servants, and he headed back to the promised land. But he was so afraid of Laban, he just kind of left in the middle of the night, and he didn't even say goodbye to Laban. <laughs> and so we know that Laban kind of caught up with him. In fact, we skipped over chapter 31, but if you, if you read through chapter 31, it talks about how Laban went running after Jacob and confronted him. But thankfully, God had told Laban in a dream, he had said, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. So God was basically telling Laban, you better, you better leave Jacob alone. Um, and so even though Jacob was afraid of Laban, these two men came to a peace agreement of sorts. <laughs> they kind of came to an agreement. And so they marked this spot with a heap of stones um, Jacob set up a stone as a pillar, and then they gathered more stones around it, and they shared a meal there. And Jake, uh, Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha, which is Aramaic for witness heap, the heap of stones. And Jacob called it Galid, which is Hebrew for a witness heap. Um, it was also called Mizpah, which means watchtower. And so at this heap of stones, at this witness heap, Jacob offered a sacrifice to God. And Jacob was, I know, very relieved that he kind of settled everything with Laban. And Laban was going to leave him to let him go peacefully. Um, so they all enjoyed this meal together. And it even says that the next morning, Laban kissed his children and his grandchildren goodbye. So that was, I'm sure, a huge relief for Jacob because he dealt with Laban for 20 years. And now he was able to just journey on back to his homeland without worry of Laban and any repercussions. But he still had to confront Esau. <laughs> so he got rid of one worry and now he's worried about what is he going to do with his brother Esau when he goes back to his homeland. So at the beginning of chapter 2, Jacob was arriving back in his homeland and starting in verse 1 it says, Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim, which means two camps. And so it's interesting. There's You could look at it as two camps in two different ways. There was kind of a camp of humans, and there was a camp of angels. But also Jacob ended up dividing his camp into two camps <laughs> as well as he was preparing to to confront his brother Esau. And I love here that God gave Jacob these angels that he could visibly see. It's kind of a moment, almost like when he saw the stairway to heaven in his dream. Mm -hmm. It's a moment when God really opened his spiritual eyes. So God is letting him see these angels that probably nobody else could see to reassure him that he is, God is on his side. God is with him. And so he had this reassurance when all these angels appeared um, uh, along his journey back home. Um, and so Jacob knows he's got to confront his brother Esau, and he wants to make peace with him. He does not want to be living in fear for his life because his brother wants to kill him. And so Jacob sent messengers ahead to meet his brother Esau, and he told he told his messengers to tell him that he had all sorts of valuable gifts for him. He had cattle and donkeys and sheep and goats and manservants and maidservants. And so when he did that, his messengers came back and said that Esau had 400 men with him. Mm -hmm. And then he got even more scared. <laughs> so he, he should feel good because he knows he's got a camp of angels with him, right? But yet... Esau's got 400 men, and he does not know what Esau's intentions are. So he is, he is really getting nervous now. And so Jacob prayed, and this is in verse 9. It says, O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. I think this is a beautiful prayer here that Jacob prays. 
um, Jacob, as he prays to God, he is reminding God of the promises that he made to him. And that's something we can do too when we pray. We can, we can remind God of the promises in his word when we pray. Um, and that's what Jacob is doing. Um, and you know, he's also showing some humility here. Jacob, through all these years, he has been growing in his faith. Um, here he says, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness that you have shown me. So he shows his humility and he's showing his dependence on God. God wants us to depend on him. And here Jacob is. He's, he's afraid, but he is turning to God. He's turning to God and he's calling the promises of God back to God um, in hopes that he is going to protect him and his family. And so Jacob, of course, selected all these gifts for his brother Esau. Do you know he had over 550 animals he selected for Esau? He had like 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. That is a lot of animals, and that's just part of what he has. That's the part he selected to give to his brother Esau. And, uh, and then starting in verse 16, it says, He put them in care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, Go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, When my brother Esau meets you and asks, Who do you belong to and where are you going? And who owns all these animals in front of you? Then you are to say, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second, because remember he divided them into two groups. He also instructed the second and the third and all the others who followed the herds, you are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. And be sure to say your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts. I am sending on ahead later. When I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. So he's sending out all these people with all these gifts for Esau, hoping that his brother can basically be bribed. <laughs> can I bribe you not to kill me? And that's what he's doing. So when he stays behind in the camp for the night by himself, this is where we get to today's story. Uh, this is when Jacob is going to wrestle with God. Uh, so, Dave, would you read to us our verses? We are in Genesis 32, verses 22 through 32. Okay. <clears throat> now he arose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his 11 children across the ford of, uh, of the Jabbok. He told them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh, so that Jacob's so that so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, "Let me go, for the dawn is breaking." But he said, "I will not let you go unless you bless me." So he said to him, "What is your name?" And he said, "Jacob." He said, "Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, <clears throat> for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed." Then Jacob asked him, asked him, and said. Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now, now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Peniel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh and the sinew of the hip. Thank you, Dave. So here Jacob is. He's alone in the camp. He sent everybody ahead of him. And this man comes to wrestle with him all night long until daybreak. And the Bible doesn't really tell us what started this wrestling. Um, but this man shows up, and it's kind of mysterious. Like, who is this man? And what is this man? Is it God? Is it an angel of the Lord? Is it... A precursor to Jesus like who is this man that wrestles with Jacob all night long but um, in verse 25 it says 
When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched. Um, one of the versions says it was dislocated. Um, so he, Jacob is wrestling with this man and he, Jacob will not let go. He will not quit. And, and so this man who probably has the power to overtake Jacob and does not, he touches his hip to try to slow Jacob down, and yet Jacob still will not let go. That says a lot about Jacob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you imagine a dislocated hip yeah. and you yeah. still won't stop like wrestling me? Like, okay. And so the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He is, I don't know what's the word for that. He is determined to win this thing. But for some reason, Jacob is really big on blessings. So here he is. He's wrestling with this man. His hip has been pulled out of socket somehow, and yet he will not let go. And he says, well, I won't let go unless you bless me. And if you think about Jacob's history, um, he bought the birthright blessing from his brother Esau for a bowl of soup. And then he tricked his father into giving him the spoken blessing um, instead of his twin brother. And now when this man is wrestling with him and he asks to stop, he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he is big on blessings. <laughs> he is determined to get his fair share of the blessings. Um, and the man asked, what's your name? And he answered, Jacob. And we all know that Jacob's name, it means supplanter or deceiver. You know, he's always trying to get something that maybe doesn't belong to him. But the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans. You know, he struggled with Esau and with Laban. You have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And so it seems that God here is now identifying himself to Jacob when he says, you have struggled with God. So that, that's a clue that this man you're struggling with, that is God himself. Um, and so this is really, this moment is like a new birth, a spiritual rebirth for Jacob here. And that's why God gives him a new name. How many times have we seen that in the Bible where God gives someone a new name or Jesus gives someone a new name? And this is the third time it's happened so far in Genesis. God named, renamed Abram, Abraham, and he renamed Sarai, Sarah, and now he's naming Jacob, Israel. So what does this name Israel mean? And, you know, when I was looking that up, there's not just one answer to that. Um, I'm going to read this quick uh, article. This was actually from a, a Jewish website, but it's, it's a Messianic Jewish website. Um, and it says, uh, when Jacob's name changed to Israel, first, who was Jacob wrestling? In this account in Genesis, a man wrestled him. Yet in Hosea 12, 4, it says he wrestled with an angel. But then this man or angel himself, as he changed Jacob's name, said that Jacob wrestled with God. Afterwards, Jacob names the place Peniel because I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. And that's in Genesis 32, 30. Here again, the name of the location actually gives us information on a person. He saw God face to face. So this man he was wrestling with was somehow God that he was seeing and wrestling with face to face. So just to clarify, Jacob wrestled God, but in the form of a man. Yet like an angel brought a message from God to change Jacob's name and character. This man God sounds familiar. Secondly, we aren't sure what exactly happened. The word used for wrestled is a bit of a mystery verb in biblical Hebrew. It only appears twice in the Bible in verses 24 and 25. The root is connected to dust particles, which could mean rolling around in the dust. But when Hosea says Jacob wrestled an angel, he uses a different Hebrew word. In this case, it's a word that means to prevail or have power as a prince. So one could say that Genesis 32 says that this man God came to Jacob to get dirty and roll around the, in the dust with him. Then he gives him a new name and character as one of prevailing power and influence with God. Do the actions of this man God sound familiar? 
Because of the different verbs used in Genesis and Hosea they des that describe Jacob's encounter, there are varying interpretations of the meaning of the name Israel. That is probably because the English language doesn't have the comparable verbs. Some scholars say Israel means one who wrestles or struggles with God. Others say it is one who strives or prevails with God. And still others say it means prince of God. I think the correct answer is yes. All of these elements can be found in Jacob's experience of wrestling. Um, wrestling this man, God, who gave him his new name, Israel. The English language just fails to describe it in a per precise way like it does in the Hebrew. So he has this new name, Israel, and we know that all of his 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. So, and still to this day, Israel is used to call God's people, the Jewish people, by name. And we even have now a country, a sovereign nation, Israel, to this day. And it all goes back to this moment when Jacob wrestled with God and God changed his name to Israel. Jacob said to God, right after he did this, he said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So God answered Jacob's question with another question. <laughs> he didn't answer his question. He just says, why do you want to know? And then he blessed him. So it's almost like he avoided the question a little bit. But he did bless Jacob. Um, and Jacob himself acknowledges here that this man he was wrestling with with God when he said in verse 30, so Jacob called the place Peniel saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. So Jacob himself is acknowledging that he was wrestling with God in this form of this man. Um, and so and then in verse 31, it says, the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and he was limping because of his hip. That injured hip if you think about it, it was a touch from God. It was, I think, a way of let, God letting him know that, hey, I am God. You, you think you can struggle and win, but really, you, you can't win. You might as well go with God. You know, we can't beat him, join him. <laughs> so God is kind of reminding him, and I'm sure that every time Jacob felt that twinge of pain, that that was a reminder of that moment when God changed his name and when he struggled with, with God. So it would have been there to remind him, but it would have also reminded him how God blessed him. After he, after he struggled with God, God blessed him again. And this is the second time he did that because the first time it was in that dream where he had the dream of the stairway to heaven. And this time it's after this night long wrestling match that he had with God. And so God is, also reminding him that he is blessing him. He's with him and he's blessing him. Interestingly, in verse 32, it says that to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. So it's it's forbidden for them to, to eat that part of an animal now, which I think is interesting. Um, and now, this is, you know, this uh, so that is true in Israel too, that because this, this it says to this day. Now, yeah. I I didn't ask uh, any of my Jewish friends if that's yeah. true or not, <laughs> yeah. um, but I assume yeah, that I, I it probably know. is true for some Jewish people somewhere to mm -hmm. even to this day. I would imagine the Orthodox. Yeah, the Orthodox mm -hmm. Jews probably still follow those. It. It's probably part of their kosher uh, rules and stuff that they follow, and I think that's an interesting. Thing, uh, that they go all the way back to this moment in time. And um, if you go on to read, um, you know, our focal verses kind of end right here, but I have to read the first part of the following chapter, chapter 33, because we kind of want to know what, what happens. Like, okay, he's about to meet Esau. What's going to happen next? Um, and if you look at chapter 33, it says, Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, <laughs> and then Rachel and Joseph in the rear. Do you think he's showing his favoritism here? <laughs> he's like, in case Esau is going to kill us all, let me put the servants up front, and then Leah, okay, she can, she can go next. She can be killed next. I mean, that's what he's doing. So 
he is blessed by God and he has definitely grown on his faith journey, but he is still human. He is he's not perfect, he still has his human flaws. Right? Yeah, you get up there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but then it says, um, it says he himself went on ahead. So even though he ordered them that way, he did at least man up and he went to the front to confront Esau himself first. So at least he didn't hide back in the back with Rachel. Um, and so Jacob is still afraid that Esau's going to kill him and his family too. But it says, he himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. And then look what it says in uh, chapter 33, verse 4. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And this... I've seen the painting done at some point of the two of them meeting. And, and Esau is standing up, and Jacob's over here. Kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, is he? Is that kiss? Uh, is he gonna kiss me or kill me? <laughs> um, and so there's this moment of reconciliation, and y'all, what could have been a horrible tragedy has a very happy ending here, and that is because of God. There's no other explanation of that except that God answered Esau's prayers. God had made promises that he was going to be with him and take care of him, and he does. And he answered Jacob's prayers. He protected him from Esau. He somehow softened Esau's heart. And so instead of coming with his 400 men to kill him, he embraced him and he welcomed him back. And it says that Esau looked up and saw the women and children Esau said, who are these with you, he asked. And Jacob answered, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. Jacob goes on to say in verse 11, he says, please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. So I love here, you can tell when you read this first part of chapter 33, that Jacob is finally, he's giving God all the glory. Um, Jacob is acknowledging that it wasn't him. It was God's grace. God, it's, God is the reason. God's grace is the reason he has all these blessings. Um, you know, and this reminds me, if you go back to that moment when he had that dream of the stairway to heaven, if you remember right after that dream, he set up the, that altar and he, he gave an oath back to God. But if you remember that oath back to God after God had given him all those blessings, God, uh, Jacob gave an oath back to God that was basically a bunch of if-then statements. He said, if you will be with me, and if you watch over me, if you will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, then you will be my God. But now Jacob has matured in his faith. There's no if-then statements. Jacob is now giving God all the glory. He's saying, God has been gracious to me. And really, God had been gracious to him all along. It's like he didn't want to believe it or he maybe he thought he didn't deserve it. God had been with Jacob all along. He'd been with him. He'd been watching over him. God had blessed Jacob exceedingly and God had returned Jacob now to his homeland safely, his promised land. And so it reminds me of us, you know, we, just like Jacob, sometimes we fail to trust God completely. Sometimes we fail to trust in God's promises and we struggle to believe and to trust. And, you know, the enemy whispers these things in our ear. Or the enemy sometimes gets in our thoughts and he gives us these doubts and fears. Will God really get us home safely? Um, and we all struggle with that. We all struggle or wrestle with God and his plan for our lives in some ways. Um, we all wrestle with God when we are busy pursuing our own plans. You know, sometimes we... We don't do the things that we know God is calling us to do. And so we struggle and we wrestle with God and God's will mm. in our own lives too. And so really, Jacob's life is a metaphor for our own lives as well. When Jacob wrestled with God, even after God wrenched his hip, Jacob would not let him go. But the truth is that it was God that would never let Jacob go. Just like God will never let us go. Um, and, you know, sometimes along the way, we need God's corrective touch. I think when God touched his hip and wrenched his hip, 
that that was a corrective touch from God to remind Jacob that God is really the Almighty mighty One. You can't beat God. Um, and you know, Jacob wasn't the only one who spent the rest of his life with some kind of a an impairment of sorts. We know that Paul in the New Testament, he had some kind of a thorn in his flesh too. Um, no, we don't really know what that thorn in Paul's flesh was. There's a lot of scholarly opinions out there on what it might have been. Some think that it was some kind of a physical ailment. Some think that it might have had something to do with when he saw the flashing light and he was blinded that maybe he had some kind of residual um, issues there. Some think it was some kind of a sin that he struggled with maybe or had trouble with maybe some kind of temptation that he, he dealt with. Uh, but whatever this was, this thorn in his flesh, sometimes we need God's corrective touch. I mean, think about Paul. If he had not had that flash of light and that moment that changed his life, where would he have been? Um, and so sometimes we need God's corrective touch. Paul, when he prayed to God about his thorn in the flesh, and this is in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 9, it said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. I know if you read through the study guide, there was a little mention about how Jacob um, was very proud of his, his human strength. Um, when he met at the well, when he first arrived uh, in the homeland of his uncle Laban, they talked about how he moved the big stone off of the well. Um, and so Jacob maybe was... A little too dependent on his own strength and so when God here he was when we saw how he 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 was so prideful and how he struggled with this man God that he wouldn't let go so God by touching his hip is giving him a reminder yes I'll, I'll tell you how sometimes things just stick with you when Leah was a teenager in Revo back to Revo days they had a guest preacher for the youth and he did a, a sermon on this passage and he, he made a joke that stuck with me and he said you know when you you know a dad and a son are, are wrestling and the dad's letting the kid win and letting the kid win and it's going on long enough and the dad kind of finally has to put a little hurt on him to get him <laughs> to surrender yeah and he said you know that's kind of what god's doing here and and he's getting him to surrender because he has to break him and he has to bend him, and but then he that allows him to bond to him, cling to him, mm -hmm. and then get blessed by him. But the whole thing about the name change was to acknowledge who he was. Uh, you know, I think right here, you know, he is just about to go back to where all all of the heel grabbing and the deception, uh, deception began, mm -hmm. and so he's got to acknowledge who he is. And God wants to change that from him. So, you know, I think about about that for us. You know, he wants us to surrender. So sometimes he's got to put a little hurt on us. Mm -hmm. wants that us corrective to touch. And then he can change us then. And and he's, he's got to change him right now. He's got to make him have that reminder right now because you're fixing to walk right back to where you've been before. And, you know, with the kids up in Denton, you know, it's like this is such a good lesson for them because – you know, you're here, and this is the little hurt getting put on you. But God wants you to change. He wants you to acknowledge what you've done, not live like that's who you are. And that's what he's doing with Jacob, you know. And, and now I'm going to change you. I'm going to change your name so you can walk back into it and not be the same. Yeah, I love that. That's some great comments, Becky. That is so true. And, you know, I think of the, like those kids in, in the juvenile detention system and when those kids get arrested and they have to serve time and all that, I think they they can come to a point where they have make a choice. They can either go down that road of staying in trouble or they can make a decision. I don't want this for my life. Right. They've, got to, and, they've got to decide to change, not so much change their name, but change their walk, change their way before they walk back mm -hmm. into where they've come from. Yeah, because and it would have been real easy for Jacob when he got back to his 
former home to fall back into his old deceptive ways. Lorded over Esau and all that, but you know, God's been working on Esau too, you know, and so And we know that we can see the maturity of Jacob's faith faith because he so wanted reconciliation with Esau. Well wasn't Esau run off? I mean was it didn't I thought that uh Isaac sent Esau away. Isaac did send well, we'll get into all that. <laughs> Yeah, we'll bring in all that. Oh, okay. But but we know that Jacob is he's going back to his to his promised land. He yeah. wants reconciliation with his brother. He wants peace, and maybe part of that is selfish because he doesn't want to live in fear for him and his family. Mm -hmm. But also, I think he that's his brother. I think he had some remorse for yeah, sure. all the things he had done, and he want he wanted true reconciliation and forgiveness and. That's why I think it's such a beautiful moment when Esau came to him and just mm -hmm. just embraced him and they wept together. I mean, that's a that's a beautiful picture and and that is definitely a God thing because that could have so easily gone in a different horrible direction. Mm -hmm. And yet God answered Jacob's prayers. Esau <coughs> met him. They were able to <coughs> reconcile in that moment. And um, anyway, so that that is our story for today. Um, you guys always have good comments. I love all that. And uh, we'll close it up with a prayer. Um, really. Good.